Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to LCK Summit 2019. It is the last game of the night. We'll see whether it can be Gen.G walking away victorious in this series, or whether Dom One Gaming are going to do what they did throughout this entire year's games in the LCK and uh, take down Gen.G yet again. Remember that, you know, if you're new to the LCK for, for 2019, you might expect Gen.G to do some winning here, but it's Dom One that we're out representatives for Rift Rivals after coming in fourth in the first season. So, uh, Genji, certainly underdogs here. Just feels like we know what a Genji victory looks like now in this series against Dam One, but we know what a Dam One victory looks like as well. Yeah. Dam One can make it all about the top lane, they're probably gonna win. If Genji can relieve that pressure and set up Ruler to carry, they'll probably win. So, is that gonna be subverted by which team in this last draft are we going to have the battle lines as clearly drawn in game number three as one and two? See if any team's going to gobble up the Aatrox, because so far your boys zero and two on the first night of the season. Yeah, exactly. Uh, not exactly what we're expecting out of uh, out of this guy. Certainly not me. Papa, you, of course, were a little bit more expectant of uh, not necessarily being able to fit the same role that Aatrox did here in the LCK. Rai is going to be the third band of this draft as Yumi's taken off the board as the fourth. So Damon not wanting to see the book kitty at all. What will be left open? I don't think Damon are going to be that interested in banning away something like the Aatrox. <laughs> so final ban here could be anything. They don't want to deal with Sona, yeah, I nope. guess. Maybe they're hoping that also means the Aurelia is dropped, but Aurelia Serge could be the right. I, I think Genji might actually consider first picking Sejuan, as weird as that sounds, but... That sounds like something that our Peanut these days would certainly do. I know that's a menacing insult, so it's kind of hard to process that one. But, no, uh, it's not a menacing insult, not at all. And it's gonna happen. Like, no, 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 This is a strategic decision. Well, strategically, the Piggy is in the middle. And also he's probably in the jungle. You, you well, know I, mean, I mean, he's in the middle of the two solo lanes. There we go. You nailed it. Uh, the Aurelia is available, though, for the first time here so far. In the LCK, the Aatrox could be paired with her if they want to, as uh, Noguri has cycled through the both of them. You're definitely not going to take both. Aurelia says just the combo everyone knows what TSM tried to pull up the other day. Yeah. It's going to be Aatrox just power picked by Damwon Gaming on the red side. Where do they go from here, though? Is an intriguing question to ponder. Could just take your jungle and there's some Gragas tune-ups. Small buffs. Yeah, just base 11. stats, basically, as, uh... Okay. That's a height. That would, uh... fans really want to see a Kuzan Yasuo be popping out here. It won't be QB. <laughs> if it was, I mean, that's just a darn one victory, uh, from what it sounds like. However, picking away the Yasuo from a Gragas composition sounds like a pretty good idea. We know that uh, they went rampant as a uh, ruler in life, thinking about being lovers today as the Zaya is locked away. Rakan available, likely to be picked up. Although we saw Rakan not exactly do the greatest of things uh, earlier on in our first series of the night. And there's an argument to go Zaya Braum so that you have a Braum to deal with Gragas cask. Yep. Uh, Right now, it feels like Zaya is at a kind of highest power ebb when you kind of compare her directly to Rakan. It usually felt like it was Rakan, 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 and then Zaya Rakan was nice together. But it was a long time ago where Zaya was kind of seen as the, the prized of the duo. And it feels yeah. like right now, Zaya with the S3 of a boss and her boss is at her highest power level relatively in a long time. So I think they would have considered Zaya bomb. They move away from it. The Lux has been seen as his counterpick and the attempt into a lot of strong laners, and with her immense range, Aftershock Lux is likely coming out in this game, an outside chance of it being pivoted to the mid lane. Yeah, the weird thing about uh, Genji's uh, decisions here, getting the uh, Zaya Rakan, means that they weren't able to get that Aurelia that uh, people have enjoyed so much, paired up with the Sejuani, like you were talking about with TSM. Not quite managed to make it work, but you can understand the theory. A lot of Lux in the recent solo queue from Beryl, but that should be no surprises. Yep, and remember Beryl was the guy that sort of came in after Hoyt uh, as uh, Galio was starting to get in himself into the meta. It feels like Beryl is the guy that picks up champions a little bit faster uh, when they're making their way back into the meta and things like that, and maybe uh, Hoyt just takes a little bit longer to get himself there. We'll talk a bit about Aftershock Lux in the game, because I'm sure this is a new thing for many people. A yep. Korean solo queue trend, but not necessarily a global solo queue trend. Secondary ban, gonna be the LeBlanc away from Kuzan. Always gonna see so many Kuzan champions banned out, and that's gonna be the Sivir off the board. So the 80 carry here with Ezreal, Sivir, and Zaya. 
Taken out of consideration. Okay. Galio Kaisa was one of those big lanes in MSI, but now Galio's nerf is seeing a lot of people move straight away from the Galio. We're going to see still the Kaisa synergy when it comes to the Plasmas with the Q from the Lux, though. Still hard crowd control for Nuclear to pump out the damage. And also, I feel like the follow-up, if any of these light bindings are sporadically hit uh, throughout this game, the follow-up, like you say, is so incredibly good with the Killer Instinct available from Nuclear if he knows that he can just dive on down onto his opponent. Cannon and Lissandra sounds exactly like Cube and Kuzan to me. And that is what's going to be picked up here. And some cohesion with this composition already. Very Freljordian coming from the mid and jungle. And then Cannon on the top side should be able to weather the storm against Noggery. Every engage. But it might not be Noggery well. playing it as the Vladimir is being looked at. Yep. Showmaker and Noggery have both played this champion. And uh, the Aatrox has had a lot of popularity in the mid lane, and now with Vladimir against Cannon, feels like a better matchup. And the laning nerfs onto Lissandra might actually relieve pressure from Aatrox trying to wave clear in mid lane as much as he can. The ad in the bottom center of the screen is actually for SK Telecom's streaming service that does a pro view like scenario on mobile. So on mobile, you can actually see. Uh, the POV streams of up to 10 players at once, which sounds really small on a mobile stream. But <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure what that means for ProView, but uh, just a shout out to that because a lot of people have been asking. We get the confirmation that it will not be mid lane Vladimir. If you've watched Dogga replay Vlad, you knew he was playing at this game. However, yep. the cannon matchup, which used to be a hard counter for Vladimir, he would he used to just run over this lane at a certain point. It's gotten better and better for Kennen over time, and the Gunblade delays the time even further, upon which Vladimir actually finds his laning leads 1v1 against Kennen. I think if there's anyone that can navigate the matchup, though, from the LCK, it is, of course, Noggery. His uh, Vladimir laning has been fantastic, but this composition looks about as Gen.G as you can possibly get without a, an Ezreal involved, because, of course, that was banned away first off. From Dom one, pick power, engage. When Zaya says, I'm ready to go, there's plenty of people that are willing to dive in there. The Vladimir, like you say, can make it tricky when it comes to those calculations the game goes on. But I like the inherent synergy and the pretty straightforward kind of point and click comp on the side of Genji. Meanwhile, Dom one, they've got a lot of cool pieces. How they come together, I'm gonna have to wait and judge. Well, if they do come together, Papa Smithy, then it's gonna be a lot of damage. Can you imagine Hemoplate going down with an Aatrox doing damage? That is terrifying! As we get onto the Rift for game number three. I believe we're on the Gen.G side of LOL Park, and also they have way more fans. So it just feels like no one cares about uh, Dom1 in our headsets at the moment, but they are a little bit further, and Gen.G fans have just been so incredibly loud. Oh, Cuve says, screw you, I'm going press the attack full laning Ooh, phase okay. on this cannon. Cannon, of course, it's such a popular pick because you lock it in, it kind of always does something. And I feel like Nico maybe even does that better in recent memories, but uh, full on hit build here, no kleptomancy even on Many this side. If you go and press the attack, you go on AD. So uh, whether it's full AD or wit's end, feels like it's gonna be not the best time. Wait. That's unsealed Wait. spellbook, no, Vladimir. No, 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 no. Look, look at what Vladimir has taken as a starting line. Um, right. Ah, needs that mana regen, Papa Smithy. Well, gotta get that mana regen. Why not just go for a Dark Seal? Why not? Well, like, if it, I, don't know. I don't know. I feel like he's actually oh. the wrong champion. I don't, I don't know what to say here. Yeah. But uh, he really wanted more than one health potion. The way he got there, the defense was Okay. That's fine. I mean, sometimes the mind games are important. Um, but yeah. uh, You called it out already. Until Spellbooks. Not a normal choice on Vladimir. Right, we don't see that. Yeah, often the phase rush, things like Predator, like there are a lot of different choices that you can go with. Now, the theory behind the Unsealed Spellbook is you want to kill Kenneth. So it's actually to go to Ignite, go to a laning summoner, and then in a team fight phase, Ghost Flash is very, very strong on Vladimir as well to keep up the chase. But given its press, it feels like both. So the prisoner dilemma, right, is when it comes to mm -hmm. actually being in a position to be competitive in certain scenarios, and it feels like Nogari's saying, I'm going 
than having Knight kill you, Cannon, and Cannon's gone, press the attack. So no one's balking at what this is about. Both of them are ruining and setting up for 1v1. Yeah. And Kube is actually going to give himself the best opportunity to, because of course, uh, Cannon in lane as uh, this on hit build is so, so strong, especially now that you can build Wits End and feel much better about it, given the state of that item. Um, also, interestingly, with a lot of the extra stats now front-loaded on things like the Ginsu's Rage Blade, it might feel better to be on a hit cannon as well because he does utilize both the magic penetration and armor penetration at the same time with this build. The new Rage Blade has lots of really interesting interactions that we haven't seen. So the one that actually was played, I believe, in... I want to say it was like LDL, so second tier in, in China, is uh, bringing back Jungle Nil with... Uh, the Rage ah, yeah, yeah. because the change, which everyone focused on what it meant for Vayne and the, uh, you know, Phantom hit abusers, but yep. it gives 15% armor penetration and magic pen. It's a lot. It's actually a really a lot, so... It feels almost like an Akali item. I know, right? Really it's it's strange, an intriguing yeah. item that's not explored yet. We'll yeah. wait to see when people play around with it. And walking up to contest Sejuani. These are more tank jungles when it comes to how the early phases come. So very much just camp for camp. Let's talk a little bit about Aftershock Lux support, which is going to be a pretty big staple in Korea. But uh, maybe we'll have to zoom out a bit. Because Canyon's saying, this is mine. Yep, and he's going to be able to take it as well. Not a lot that they can do. Beryl's also going to get the first roam as uh, a ward goes down. That distracts the dumb one. Uh, Members long enough for Peanut to get his way out, but he's on vision everywhere here on this bottom side. They weren't even really interested in killing him. They felt like getting rid of his Bramble back was enough. Able to roam first because the Lux had a longer leash to leave lane, and Frog is happy to get in there and look for the steal. The Aftershock Lux, if you're wondering how you proc the Aftershock, it's pretty simple. You hit the Q. If you don't, you ain't got no Aftershock. That's how it works. Feels so a little bit like Aftershock Silas and how he works, needing to hit the abscond if you're actually going to be able to use it. But uh, the upside is that even though Aftershock was nerfed, still a lot of flat stats early for a very squishy mage, right? Lux is usually very squishy, so if you don't have Aftershock, you might hit your Q and yet the enemy flashes on you and you die. It's the yep. reality behind it. With the Aftershock, remember that shields are effectively health that interact with resist, so it actually makes her way more attack than you might expect. Side, he engages early, Peanut's not in position. Yeah, knockup is going to come forward, but Ruler just takes too much harassment, and of course, the minion wave is there and does hurt at this level. So you max shield first, you put a couple points in E for laning phase, and then when you actually do hit that binding and throw out the shield, you either engage on a Lux, who suddenly has, let's say, kind of 200 health, but it's way more than that, because getting 70 armor and MR, or the your, the AD carry, who's now got the shield and is killing you. So, it's actually really strong for laning trades. It's very much a laning support choice. And in team fights, you just hit the shield on as many allies as possible. That's your first max, the W. Like well, you can see, top side of the map, uh, Nogari is uh, not having the greatest time against Cubay, which uh, is what you'd come to expect. Cannon, uh, 80 cannon like this is just very, very difficult 1v1 in lane to deal with. Can you? Coming on up, though, and will spot Peanut once again. Gets over, can't steal anything. Arctic Assault, pretty good ability to get himself over that one. Final point about the Lux, she can outrange almost everyone, so she stays safe purely from being such high range. And both her E and R are reveals, so if you actually lose control of the map, you can actually spot pretty well between Blue Trinket, uh, your ult, and also your... Well, that was the E going down there as well onto Ruler, so passive not actually propped there by Beryl. See the laning is just going to continue. Very even is this farming scenario as our showmaker deals with popcorn chickens very easily, as uh, we've learned before from the Satrox. And when you think of the Lissandra versus Aatrox and the cannon, on him cannon no less, versus Vladimir, you kind of in your head say, ah, they're taking a lot of autos. That must be hurting on the CS score. It's not, actually. They're no. overall ahead in CS over the enemy by about two between the two lanes. So at the end of the day, and I want to getting away with these landing phases just fine. What's it in service of, given that mid-game seems really powerful and straightforward for Genji? Not to know, but just a kind of takeaway here is that we're not seeing CS leads and what can be kind of tricky lanes to get through. Yep, and as these uh, minion waves are going to crash, the fresh ones anyway, it should be uh, Darmwan and Genji on complete even footing here on the bottom side as our ruler misses one of them, and therefore it's going to be one in the lead there for Nuclear. Nogri on the top side continues shoving in over and over again. Vladimir is doing absolutely fine. So like you say, I feel like it's, it's a very weird question though, because 
Damwon's win condition is Nogari most of the time. Genji's win condition is Ruler most of the time. And I feel like they're on opposite sides of the map and they're both doing absolutely fine as this game uh, progresses from the early to mid game. And what it means the game goes on is it's kind of scattered because yeah, it's going to be hard to understand. Play the Ruin King, Wits and Cannon, who's going to, you know, be competitive with Vladimir the whole game. It's never going to be Vladimir's solo killing with reliability outside of maybe a chance Ignite kill and notice that Ignite available plus six minutes. Yep. Now, taking as the game goes on, it'll be too hard to kill the cannon. So you might say, all right, there's team fights and Genji's easy to execute, they should win. I think that's fair logic, but Dumb One also, they've got these maybe buttons, like what the cast could be, what the world ender could be. So it could actually be super competitive in the 5v5, even if I look at Genji and say, with that much CC, it should be pretty reliable that you shut down one member of down one and then kind of roll through them. Yeah, we sort of cycled down these uh, these lanes and that's what the conclusion we've come to. I feel like if uh, Canyon can shut Peanut out of his jungle though, it can be pretty scary. And you can see already, he's 18 CS in the lead. That is a lot of camps that Canyon has over what Peanut has. As uh, Peanut can't quite find uh, the Winter's Wrath. Kind of a bizarre lead given the laning matchups, but it is what's happened. Yeah. I just feel like uh, Canyon just farms the jungle so much more quickly, especially once his uh, Runic Echoes does come in. It's very, very close. He's on the top side of the map. That's where things are getting scary. While there have been some gasps as Nogari's health is coming back very, very quickly. Canyon takes that one down, but that's a great snare to Lissandra putting in some fantastic work from Kuzan Cyber Canyon. He's able to get the flash out. Waits on the flash as well, does Kuzan. And that is going to be Canyon being taken down. But it is the jungle is traded, and now Kuzan is in trouble. Ring of Frost. Great position to get to, but I have a feeling he's not out of the woods yet. And that is going to be the empowered auto attack, allowing Showmaker to grab that kill for himself. 1-0-1 now for the Aatrox and 1-0-1 as well for Nogari. If you're wondering where the top laners were, Cube got all in with Ignite by Nogari earlier, and that's why he was so low on health. He kind of had to watch on awkwardly. Yes, first bud goes off a smart delayed flash from Kuzan. You'll see that one on the replay, but Cube can't join, and eventually the numbers is what actually tips this game. Yeah, Kuzan actually flashing very uh, aggressively to make sure that he could uh, hit his ultimate at the right time. Wasn't able to kill Kuzan, and was therefore able to get uh, over the wall. Here on the bottom side of the map, though, teleport to come in here from Showmaker as they're looking for Ruler. Lands the knockup, Featherstorm is going to be there, gets the flash out of this ire and it's not over yet ruler as uh, canyon was making his way down but doesn't actually go for any sort of dive that means the tp event gets them nothing unless they take this drake bot lane is very low ruler should be out of the fight so this should be done one game yep barrel should be able to make sure that canyon loses and none of his health utilizing his uh, shields that he has available for him decides not to even do that as uh, Canyon's going to be able to grab that very easily and in fact i feel like ocean drake is something that can be pretty useful for the bottom side of the map. However, everywhere else, not going to be very useful at all for Dom One having a, a Vladimir and an Aatrox. Definitely not the highest value, I will agree with you there. Showmaker's walking up. He could just be taken down here, but his flash is still up, so this is actually more difficult than it first appears. And Showmaker's actually very restrained. He does ask the mental question of, wait, where's the Sejuani? He pulls away. Yep, and uh, Peanut was going fishing, but uh, didn't actually catch anything at that point. <laughs> going to slink back into his jungle. The Gromp is going to be taken, and then the Wolves as well to follow that one up. As we're checking out to see uh, how things are doing. Already 46%. Yeah. C was that CDR? What? It must be CDR. How do you get 46? 46? I don't know. <laughs> That's a nutty amount of uh, CDR showmaker. Well done. What else could it be? Well, I mean, it shouldn't. It sh theoretically shouldn't oh. be able to be CDR. <laughs> I, I follow <laughs> yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, but uh, what else is uh, measured in a percentage? I'm totally sure. Crit, baby. Yeah, there we go. 46% crit. Aatrox. Ah, uh, maybe it's tenacity. Because there's a lot of different Ooh, tenacity yeah, effects in the game, and not all of them are. Uh, and they often, yeah, they do all stack as well. In different ways, too. Yep. So, it's probably tenacity. I actually don't know for sure. Yeah, well, he's got 46% of something, and I don't think it's cooldown reduction, because uh, the maximum he can get there is uh, 40 I feel like both teams are about 46% close to the victory here. <laughs> yep. Well, uh, Nogri isn't. He's 100% uh, close to dead. As our peanut locks that one down and the crowd goes completely nuts here in Low Park. You don't need analysis. Stats bear out, Atlas. You got nailed at that one. Yeah. With your numbers. 
first to the gank. Nice stuff from Peter. Hasn't been lane ganking or particularly bloodthirsty so far in this game. And it'll be a lovely objective to pick up top side around the Vladimir if they could get the Rift Herald. Yeah, Kuzan gets out with the claw there in the mid lane, but him getting out means that he certainly doesn't have very much pressure. Are we feeling this, Canyon? Showmaker does have World Ender available. There are some lower health bars. If Beryl can actually snipe someone, that could be a huge deal. His final spark not going to be able to steal away any shellies here from this pit. Gen G, get away scot free. Okay, Showmaker. Grand entrance is going to get life out of the way, so no worries about the infernal chains. Back away. Just an advantage to Gen G. Just a good play from them. And Nuggery never got the chance to use is W. Bot lane, afterthought so far this game. Farm, farm, farm from both. You might wonder if you've been Yeah, I was actually, builds. I was going to ask you this about the Man Immune. Yeah, no Man Immune present. There was definitely a big kick in going for the Muramana Kaisa build. Reasoning behind that was extra 10 AD on the ability. And of course, everyone does that CSI gift whenever an AD item gets any more or less AD about what it means for Kaisa's breakpoints. Yep. Does mean you could go Muramana plus pickaxe plus Doran's Blade and hit a very early 100 AD. But people don't like the tier. People don't like the amount of gold spent on mana, so it's dropped away with most recently. Yeah, you might be able to get to that spike earlier, but you sacrifice any laning phase for that by having to spend uh, your gold on a tier, which feels real bad. So that is, uh, that is why Nuclear has opted out of it. I don't believe anyone in the history of League of Legends or anyone in the future will have quite these items on Vladimir, but... <laughs> Here you are, Nogari. You got a lot of everything. The random sampler, including a Doran's ring. I, I think the only the only reason why that's true is that he has a Doran's ring, which is just so dumb. But he's Nogari. You can't really fault him, right? Because he's he's currently within touching distance of what can be a really really rough matchup. And I'm sure Vladimir, and he's one zero one one and one. And if you want to be glass half full, you say this item is health and AP, and you double scale on that based got, on your gives passive. early game stats as well as two potions. And that's, no. compared to the Dark Seal, it gives you the health and AP, so you double scale on it. Again, that's, ah! Uh, oh, uh, okay, Stealth Vault has to come in there from Kuzan, gets the flash out of Showmaker. So in theory, actually, it is uh, a win for Kuzan. I understand the argument of why not this item, but it still makes me roll my eyes. Oh yeah, it's, it's not good. Someone has to try and do the positivity though, and uh, I was tasked with that. I don't know whether I've uh, succeeded in doing it anything but facetiously. Uh, that's what happens when these things happen, is our uh, light binding into all of the big buttons. And that is support and jungle that are able to wipe out a Rakan without him ever being able to get out of CC. Sometimes all your buttons hit, and even though it's support Lux, you're still dead. Support down on the side of Gen.G. Life on a bit of a mission. He does die a little bit when it's uh, the laning phase is breaking down. It's probably one of the kind of few criticisms for a rookie player, and I think Life has had a really good first year in spite of Gen G's results. Can also be difficult as Rakan as well in this uh, current day and age, it's because you can't get yourself around and ward things like a, a tanky support could otherwise do. And that is going to mean that the Mountain Drake is going to go pretty comfortably over to Darmon unless uh, Peanut wants to sacrifice himself for an attempted smite steal. Doesn't. And that is going to mean Ocean Drake as well as the Mountain now belong to Darmon. Pretty comfortably moving themselves towards this mid game as well. With end and the lifesteal quotient of the blade done for the cannon. Probably not going to go into gun blade from here. It has to be blade to really synergize with the Presley attack, but still attacking lane. That's to the benefit of very nice CS numbers. First CS, uh, CC lands, by the way, and life is dead. Exactly. If one hits, you die. That's how it goes. You can't miss any skill shots, so nice and easy stuff. But in case you're wondering, still AP stacking and pen focus on the ground. Yep, and that's why he's uh, going to do some uh, pretty relevant damage. Looks like uh, Merlin Omicron's where he's heading to after this. Oblivion Orb should be uh, what that Ruby Crystal is going to become a part of. Showmaker wanders on forward as uh, Peanut was discovered there by the sweeping lens, so not going to be face checking anything. Too dangerous here is the Aatrox. And do you feel like this is uh, reminiscent of game one or game two? Pump? Because we did have these lulls, right, in the mid game, but who is that going to benefit? Is it going to be Dom one getting to a late game that they like a whole lot more? I mean, I'm looking at Kaiser and Vladimir and feeling like they're more happy, but you look over the Gen G side and things are much better as you head towards late game for them also. Game one was definitely that 90 10 to Dom one. They also yeah. played well in. And then Gen G just with the kind of cards they were dealt 
made some good choices after the early game in game number two. I think in game number three, it's very much like a, a 54 46 because I feel like Genji is right about now hitting their stride. You know, as Zaya hits two items with the core items done, they can do a lot. Very, and it should reliably happen. So coming off and being able to get a lead, get a Baron, and close the game. It feels like Gen G are very comfortable with their current position, but Dumb One also have both high ceiling players, and in this game, tools that could be used to manufacture a pick out of nowhere and could subvert that. So I feel like I'm more happy as Gen G, but I'm not surprised anyway if Dumb One makes the next pick. Yeah, I think that this is uh, probably the closest that we've seen uh, this in this series so far. I felt like there was one team that was. Uh, Holding on to a bit of inevitability in both of the games, Darwin in game t game one and uh, Genji in game number two, and this one feels a little bit more up in the air. It feels like there is a lot more evenness going on. So excited to see who is actually going to be able to pull ahead. So far, it's Darmon with a slight advantage when it comes to the gold, but when I say slight, I uh, emphasize that. It's extraordinarily close. No one is really pulling ahead. Canyon is looking to try and get uh, Darmon into a better position as the Gragas is lurking around this bottom side. Item finished Spellbinder. N almost never see this from a Vladimir's first item finish. This is just, I'm going to find that flank with teleport damage. That's the reason you go for Spellbinder. Right now he's playing around with Summoners too. And that's the yeah, I was going to say, it looks like you, he's uh, started a new account and hasn't changed the Summoner spells yet. I know it uh, should be Ghost instead of Teleport, but it's what it feels like here with the heal teleport, something you never see. Heal stops him being dived, and he's got a Spellbinder, so he doesn't need yeah. Flash as readily right now. Can always cycle it later, of course. And for the flanks, the Spellbinder first for the flank is what Nungari has done. The possibility of having Ghost is actually fantastic here as well, because, you, because you've got the Spellbook, right? Like, you don't have access to phase rush or the predator or any of these extra I movement speed but now with uh the spellbinder completed and the opportunity of switching towards something like a ghost he's able to make up for that lack of mobility a little bit better Nogari, we know is often able to find his way into a back line regardless of what's going on probably wants a proto belt pretty soon bam 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 in the top side as the bottom lane turret finally falls around 1940 that's the first turret of the game yep we're slowing down it's Gen G we pace. certainly are actually uh Sorry guys, we should have got a little bit more excited for that tower falling down. We've been sort of lulled. Take your lulls when you get the Atlas. Yep. You know, speaking of lulls, wants to find something in the top side. Nagui does cycle that heal, kind of feeling that Sejuani is close, seeing him for the ward. Almost two items here for Kuzan, but uh, Showmaker does have both of his completed in the Ghost Blade and the Black Cleaver. Nagui, good get though, but he's got Sanguine Pool, and uh, Kyuve's got a lot of attack speed, so he should be able to get a big jump on this. Turret. On hit cannon wants free time with a turret and Dumb One up punishing in other areas. That's just a straight up win yeah. for the on hand cannon. So Dumb One needs to be faster in moments like this. When you see Sejuani top, you should be making your own counter rotation on other parts of the map. Well, it's actually Gen G going for some sort of counter rotation as Villasandra had the opportunity of heading up that river. A lot of vision available from Dumb One, so it would have been spotted. But I do like where Kuzan's head's at. It's really good to check in with these uh, new additions uh, to these rosters as uh, Nogri's in trouble. Kyuve is just uh, smacking him down. He's going to be able to grab that turret very, very easily, and Nogri can't actually stay in lane against this cannon. Hasn't built to. He's against an on-hit cannon, so the agency here for Nogri is worlds apart from what we saw in game number one and game number two, Atlas. Now he has an Oblivion Orb. I just don't, like, I feel like Nogari is one of those uh, players where he feels like he's so good at Vladimir, it doesn't matter what items he builds, and now he's just building as many different ones as he can possibly find. No one can copy the spell. No. That's a toughie. Oh, Kuzan not going to be able to steal it with the Q and the Mountain Drake, the second one here of the game, going over to Darmon. In fact, uh, they have a monopoly on uh, that particular pit this game. And whatever team it is in the world, the clock hits 20, the enemy has two Mountain Drakes, and you, you check yourself a bit, because you know Ooh, what it yeah. could mean. Isa is the fastest Baron killer of any AD carry, too. So, very close to that uh, against his Rage Blade as well, which is going to make things even more difficult. Calculations uh, are never clear with. in moments like this. Lux should have her first item soon. Still slowly cribbing together the first item. Actually, this will be picked up relatively soon. Well, it's actually about 500 gold behind Rakan because just no turrets have gone down. So, yeah. even though you'd think yeah. she'd be piling in, oh, it's Nash's dead. Yeah, uh, Barrel's dead. 
Cement. Sorry about that, uh, guys. I uh, wasn't able to provide adequate hype. Everyone behind me here in Lowell Park was extraordinarily excited, but as soon as we saw that all come out, that was a dead loss. I feel like people are only being burst or no one's going near. Yeah, exactly. It's almost like my job as a play-by-play as a -play is being nullified by the fact that everyone's dead before I even get to talk about it. Finally, you're obsolete, Alex. Uh. It just means we can get to our cricket commentary like it was hey, painted. there we go. Everyone knows that I'm an analyst, Papa Smithy. That's how I started my career. That's where I belong. <laughs> you guys should have seen the uh, sarcastic smile from Papa Smithy's side of the desk. I like that we get this extended replay because you see what Beryl did. He checked Baron. He said, I wonder if they're on Baron. So I had to walk up toward that. So yep. it was good to get the initial context as why she was even topside. Seems like the first read of I shouldn't walk up, I'll alt it was the right one and not the further, because kind of went both directions. Yeah, and also did have a lot of information. In fact, they had a lot of wards around the area, just unfortunately. Uh, if you're even within any sort of range of uh, Peanuts Ultimate after a Q, that's uh, a really scary time. Well, as you can see, there's not a lot of blocks in that health bar. So how was your holiday in Atlas? Oh, it was fantastic, Papa. You know, I was, uh, I didn't see you at MSI. It was very sad not to see you there, but I hope you made the most of it. I absolutely did. I certainly watched a lot of MSI, and then I went to Jeju Island, which is a really beautiful place here in Korea. And uh, my girlfriend showed me around, and it was it was a lot of fun. Was there any sipping of mojitos on the beach? Uh, not on the beach, but there was certainly sipping mojitos by the. We're sipping Baron real fast. Yeah, there. this uh, purple worm is going down very very quickly, but Damwon are going to move away from it as Cube teleports in, managing to bait that one out as uh, Kuzan moves on for the flank as well as. Uh, I'm looking to try and get some sort of wraparound, looking for the positional advantage, don't find it, and back away. And in fact, now Gen G are able to take down the entire outer ring of turrets and get themselves something for nothing in that exchange. Exactly. Damon Gaming have a lot of Baron damage. We had that confirmed already. However, they're not realistically going to rush it down. If they continue to lose map control, we've already talked about how scary it is. If Gen G in the mid game can decide when fights start, they're going to end on their terms as well. At some point, maybe it's correct for Damwon to just throw all their damage and take what's a 50-50 Baron, because else maybe things are going to really fall away from them, because if Gen G get the Baron, I think Damwon Gaming, it's lights out. Yep, 1,350 damage here from Juve uh, with uh, Press the Attack by itself. He has been hitting Vladimir a lot of times. Yep. That's impressive. Got those laning core items down. Now Nogri just doesn't want to be anywhere near him. Top. Ruler doesn't want to be anywhere near anyone as his Flash and Ultimate are now on cooldown. Not much of an investment here for Darmwan as now they're looking towards this Baron, understanding that their main damage dealer has all of their escape tools no longer available as Barrel. This is what happens when you don't hit that Aftershock. Does eventually find it, but doesn't actually get any value whatsoever. Who smites? Remember, Nogari's already switched over. Yeah, he's got that one. Life is now over the wall. Peanut wants to find his Yolo! opportunity moment to get in. He gets in there. The 50-50 is won by Damwon. It's now Kuzan into the backside. Cube has his ultimate, but that's not where the damage is. It's the autos, and Genji wipe the fight. But two still remain alive from Dom. And that's why they go for it. They got the double smite. They say, well, screw it. Let's go for this. Otherwise, maybe we'll never get back into this game. However, where are the Baron buffs going to be? They do have both teleport users keeping the Baron. And that was the minimum they could get from this to make it worth it. And even then, Gen G control the minion wave. Yep, the split pushes are the ones that are able to get that one done. And Showmaker is looking to try and get this, uh, these three members of Gen G by himself ghost blading towards them. Understanding that it's actually a, a 2v4 situation. He's a man with that. I can appreciate that. Oh, yeah. Down one game. Stones, that one. Just decided they were going to get the Baron. And they did. They had the double smite. If they didn't get the smite off, then they deserved to lose, right? That oh, yeah. But, uh, they had the higher level smite. It was a level 15 smite, I believe, at the time from Nagori compared to Peanuts level 13. So at least pick that one up. We'll see if it was close at all. The replay here, because they were never getting the Baron and getting out. That part was not. Good. Oh, yeah. Especially when Barrel took so much damage at the beginning. And uh, the exhaust was used extraordinarily early on it on hit cannon. Plus smites uh, here. Oh, oh it was it very low. low. It was very low. I guess they did the E old, well, when it hits 1100, press the smite button. And, and uh, uh, actually, so, to be honest, it could have just been uh, canyon with better timing or something like that, because uh, if Peanut smited early, then that just means that they get it for free afterwards. So. I believe it was a double smite from Damwon and not a counter smite from Peanut, but uh, I'm not 100% yeah. clear on that one. Hard to tell, of course. Yep. 
because now Nogari does get to run down with the Baron, and finally, Atlas took 27 minutes, he got Q-Face Tower. And he also has a Void Staff as well, and that's a real item, Pub Smith. He's got a lot of weird items. Uh, he's sold the Doran's Ring. We're playing real League of Legends now. He's moving fast, and he's uh -huh. got penetration. So look, he's got things. Yep. And he's got the Run Fast guy summon a spell as well. Ooh. Yeah, he's got a Ghosty Boy. Double Ghosty Boy is actually coming out from this guy. He's got the Spellbinder picked up. Oh. It's yeah. old school Cuve here. He's found another time to fit in a Rage Blade. How about yeah. getting a lot of value this. out of the 15% of both the Wits and the Blade? That's what I was talking about before, right? It's cool, it. man. It used to just be Blade, Rage Blade, purely yeah. for the Phantom hit, but actually now the Penetration Stacks make it really relevant for this particular build. Yep, Wits End's pretty good at it. And uh, he's still going to get a lot of value out of the Phantom hit as well, given the... Uh, Blade of the Rune King that he does have, and you can see, oh, I mean, these autos are really starting to hurt. He's finally done it. It was the cannon that was required. Emo play comes in as Nogari's trying to fight back against Cubey and does so quite well. Tides of Blood plus a uh, Crimson Rush proc would certainly have just killed the cannon. Uh, done one. And he's walking forward. Does he show sure make it very aggressive here? And now not Beryl. letting them get any time with any of these turrets. Barrel wants to do his budget. Uh, budget Zoe impression here. Find a very long range binding. The way it works is throws out the binding, throws out the W, and then the shielding means it can walk up to a turret and siege it down. And remember, they had no turrets a minute ago. That is three out of turrets down, so some important standing gold, but definitely not a barren buff power play to write home about after the initial deaths made it more difficult. Yeah, 400 gold. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, they were able to get past the deficit that Genji put them in after winning the fight after the Baron, I guess, is uh, what you can say. And what do we say in Champ Select? Problem for Dumb One Gaming is if Genji get a Baron buff, it kind of closes out the game. That was the Dumb One Baron they desperately wanted to get in It was off the board for Genji. It got them some initial starts, but it's not going to be a game winner for Dumb One Gaming. Cube ultimate is going to miss there on Inaugury. He does have the pool as the Hemo Plague is already down, but is he just going to die? No, he's not. The autos are there, and Cube keeps himself alive. Showmaker teleports just a little bit too late. Nice play from Inaugury to try to make a turn. It wasn't going to be enough, though. He does go down in the end, so that's a pretty long death timer. 43 seconds for that one. Importantly for Darmwon, Showmaker didn't teleport to his doom. But now at least, Genji get a kill, but no more. Yeah. See what it actually means to the rest of the map here. 2,000 gold. Not even that just yet. Is the lead for Genji. Final spark is going to clear out this minion wave. And Dom one. They seem to be switching between defensive and proactive aggressive play very, very easily uh, so far this series. It has actually impressed me quite a lot. The fact that, you know, you've got Showmaker moving into the lane and just wandering forward, right, and uh, demanding that respect. But they have been able to uh, play it a little bit more slowly. Just looking at uh, the things that we wanted out of Dom One, uh, moving from spring to summer. So there are certainly some things that uh, you can say they have improved on in the off-season. I love some of the itemization choice. We talked about the synergy between Blade, Wit's End, and Gint's Rage Blade, but notice the decision from Ruler here. He does slow down on an Infinity Edge, and he goes for double utility items, more Malmordius, so that he can yeah. at least be a threat against Vlad and not just be up in the air and die on the way down. And also the double executioner's calling across the cannon and the Zyre. Remember, this cannon's much more of an auto attacker, much more of an AD carry roll rather than the AP burst that we're used to. So given that, a lot of nice synergy there. Meanwhile, Nuclear's got no QSS till now. QSS is done, but still going to have plenty of problems when Kuzan enters the fight. Yeah, and Ruler's also going to have some incredible scaling once that uh, Infinity Edge is completed as well, as we do have a fight brewing. Cube is on the bottom side, but has Teleport available. Ties of Blood don't find a target here, as Nogari is very frightening. Deep Ward is onto the red buff area, not scouted. Baron Dumb just Gaming. spawned, and Darmwon is straight back oh, yeah. on it. There is no smite on Nogari this time around. Canyon has his. But Cube is looking to just take things down. It's a 50-50 once again, oh! and it's stolen by Zaya. What the heck, Genji? They have the Baron and 
They might just win the fight here as well as Beryl is in trouble, but never mind. Nogger is trying to turn this one around. Ruler still alive, doesn't get any snares though. And now Showmaker is chasing after him. That knock up, not going to find the target. Can he get the next one? The answer's no double knock up. Ruler, Ruler can he do it? Two versus three. Nogger goes into the Sanguine Pool and they are running away from the bottom lane of Gen G. Meanwhile, sense. yeah, QV is just going to try and take down this Nexus. Nuclear is dead. And QV says, guys, is it okay if I win? Is that all right? He's going to flash over and Nogger is going to end that party. But still, Genji are trying to fight. It is going to be the final spark landing, but it doesn't do a lot of damage. Ruler turns around, kills him. The pesky support doing some silly things. And now you know who the real carry is. Double kill for Ruler in the river. He's going to push further up. That was some yakety suck sacks oh, Fiesta, yeah. but man, was it fun to watch. Ruler doesn't get the kills at the start, but him staying alive and putting out as much damage as he did almost just had the game end Atlas with the back door. Here's the full replay from all of it. A lot to take in to fight on multiple fronts. Remember, Fina comes in, could have been a smite anyway. 806 was the health bar when the smite came in, and then an auto of all things kills it. But watch Ruler free hitting on the back, and they forget about him, and only an exhaust from Beryl stops him just killing everyone in a 4v5. Yeah, Beryl would have died in two auto attacks. And remember, he didn't even have his Infinity Edge at this point. He goes and buys it after this, and Showmaker it's still getting so juiced everywhere, this. right? But they're able to re-engage life places perfectly. Great synergy between Ruler and Live on the back end. Send more bad guys, says Ruler, the anime <laughs> hero of the Gen Z story to the same degree that Nogari has been the hero of the Dumb One story. But Ruler's got the Baron, Ruler's feeling good, and they push up knowing there ain't much left on that Dumb One gaming nexus. Yeah. Uh, the control ward is going to be put down on the dead inhibitor. Uh, Nogari should be able to help try and push this one out. But remember, the Baron was stolen and they lost both of their Nexus turrets oh, yeah. and an inhibitor. This game is about as in Gen G's court as you could possibly get it. And uh, Darmon are going to desperately try and hold on. They do have a very cool hat on their Hemomancer. And uh, Nogari needs to be respected in these fights. It's not like they auto win on the side of Gen G or anything like that. Just but, uh, so you hard, see, Atlas. Yeah, Genji, I'm sorry, Cubey does a lot of damage as well if they do try and get in for these flanks. High crowd control and ruler this fed is so difficult to deal with. Yes, with a huge outplay, something could happen, but there's a more involved in there. There's a lift up. It's so hard to stop ruler. Yeah, and now, because there's no Nexus turrets, Genji just gets to stay grouped as five yeah. and try and push down one back methodically over and over again. If they can hold onto their health bars, there's nothing stopping them they don't need from to just play. staying here and do that. They don't need to clear three lanes, because if they get the right CC hit and it's 5v4, you just start hitting the Nexus while you're hitting the enemy champions to end the game. And so. see the top wave as well. Yep. It's gigantic. It's starting to stack up. It's going to push back, reset in the mid lane as well. But the fight has started nuclear. He's in a whole lot of trouble. He's actually losing a fight against a super creep. As the explosive cast does about nothing. Himo plate goes down. But is that going to be the best? Sanguine pull comes out just in time for Nogari. But it's Ruler. He's able to get so much work done. Oh my god, this Zaya triple kills there. Beryl's gonna go down. It's the Quadra and it's the game. Gen G on the board picking up their first game of summer. And summer is showing us new things. Atlas, Katie Rolster and Gen G, they were at Worlds last year, but had nothing doing in the spring season. Both of them leave the first day of the season with wins. A very hard fought one from Gen G. They open today 0 and 4 against someone gaming in the LCK. They get the victory, their fans lose their minds, and suddenly hope springs eternal for Gen G. And I think uh, a play that we haven't actually spoken about uh, over the three games has actually been Kuzan. But a lot of his more utility plays throughout this series have been fantastic. Going back to his Silas in game number two, he was brilliant, and the Lissandra performance was different to what Fly was able to provide in a lot of those victories that Genji did have. It's a great performance here from these guys. And definitely, I really like the fact that you could see in his Silas game, all of his ults were thoughtful. They will always fit the start. It was never mad. Shen plus Silas, what an OP combo. I'll take that every time. He was always problem solving. His silver ult steal ended up being really consequential. Yeah. I think Kuzan is a real thinking man's player, and I was very impressed with his debut on Genji. Yeah, sort of understated, not trying to go out there and prove himself or anything like that. You don't like need that. to be the carry on Genji. Oh, hell we no. know who the yeah. carry on Genji is. You need to fit your role, play the meta champs, and be able to be a facilitator. And I think he did that with understated grace. Yep, certainly did.
Uh, life and Ruler on the Lovers Jewel on the bottom side of the map. Life got caught out a couple of times. Actually, got caught out once. Really, one notable time. Didn't actually let that happen again. And uh, we're going to see two wins for the Rakan so far here today. This one probably being the more impressive from the Rakan side. And uh, Ruler just knows how to play this Zaya to the point where he's doing damage and playing defensively in exactly the right way. Because playing... Uh, an AD carry that doesn't have a gigantic range that's going to try and hyper carry against Aatrox and Vladimir is ridiculously hard. Like, that is really hard. Yeah, not big on the Aatroxes today. Zero and three for Aatrox. Still yeah. a strong champion, but was uh, problem solved around multiple different ways in this series. The Peanut fans are happy. The Ruler fans are happy. I think it's hard to state how important this victory was for Gen G because they came in with their heads held high and probably thought top three is the minimum for us yeah. in spring season. But the moment those two losses in week one came in, they never got back from that. They just plummeted. They were irrelevant when it came to the contendership for the top. They only had that big moment of beating Griffin in a series. Here we are in summer winning to justify it. Also seeing good performances from a new player and Kuzan in particular. You know that means a lot for an org that's oh, a very, very proud org for players who've been around the block for a while. And Cube even got some monkeys off his back in this game because he actually got to win a lane against Nubber. Yeah, being able to actually win lane, uh, even though, you, you know, it's a decent matchup for the on-hit cannon, but this is one of the Cube champions, one of the staples that's in his repertoire. I think of him and I think of uh, on-hit cannon and Nah. Like, that is what you what you think about when it comes to Cube. So to be able to bring that one out and be so successful on the pickup behind a ruler that's doing exactly what ruler does. If anything stays the same on Genji, it's ruler being ridiculously good. And uh, it was just really impressive and great to see them come back from what was a loss in game number one pretty effectively from Dom one. Decisively, well. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Game number one was really never in doubt. We even loved the draft onwards from Dom one. In this particular game, Dom one just. It was a really tricky game to win, I think, because you never really saw a phase and said, yes, this is where Dumb One definitely wins. Even team fights were really hard to execute on the Dumb One side because when does Kaisa go in? When is the time? Because Kaisa's always biting the time, biting the time, reposition kill, and it's yeah. just, with all the CC, it's so hard to pull that off in a game like this. And we talked about how easy to execute Gen G would be. They are also one of the best teams in team fighting where they, you know, on hit cannon. Understand, Cube really understands the role more often than not. And short of the just throw everything at the Baron moment for Dumb One Gaming, it was actually plain sailing for Gen G in other scenarios. Yeah, and actually, you know, Peanut flashing in here wasn't actually the one able to get it. It was a Blade Caller that uh, stole away the Baron. But uh, it felt like it was desperation on Dumb One's side. I don't think this was necessarily the moment. This was when they knew that it was falling away from them. They had to try and team fight their way back in, and this is just Ruler being extraordinarily good in a situation that honestly a lot of other AD carries would have just died, right? That's why spring is such a unique season, LCK Spring 2019, as we had players in the sixth place and eighth place teams, actually seventh and eighth, I should say, Gen G and Afrika Freaks and eighth. Yeah. We had two players, uh, Ruler and Keen, who arguably have best in role players. <laughs> but they, their teams finished seventh and eighth, and they're the carry, and they need to carry for that team. But they stepped up to the point in those teams where you could actually say, don't change anything in summer. Uh, yeah, okay. Can you imagine yeah, yeah, yeah. players and teams like that where actually they did their role perfectly, and just yeah. couldn't happen around them. Ruler was that player for Gen G, and I think Kuzan, as he said, may be that understated name that allows Ruler to really pop up. Yeah, I feel like Kuzan is almost one of those uh, perfect fits. Like you were talking about with uh, Prey on KT Rolster in our first series of the night, it feels like he fits for so many different reasons. And I think that Kuzan is another example of that. Because you can see, like, 12.7k damage, he didn't do all of the, all that much, but he's got uh, Kuzan on... Uh, sorry, Hube on his 23.3k uh, damage uh, cannon on the top side of the map. 29.3. Uh, 29, sorry, yes. Uh, that's, uh, that's a lot of damage. Pops me. A lot of it just in lane against the Vladimir, but he got to build the way you want to build. The moment you take press the attack, we all called the build, right? We knew yeah. it was going to start with Wits End, go from Blade, and then situational, and he could even go to Rage Blade. That fits like a glove with all the synergies there. You may have yeah. lost the on hit, but you've got so much extra and pen. And having double pen yeah. at the very beginning, right? Like, that was the trade-off with the item is why it still feels New good Rage Blade is going to open up some choices. Again, we talked about how in Italy and the 
LPL have picked it up. There's going to be champions. The Akali one is the one where I'm like, Did Yeah, I know. Like, like, does that ever actually oh, happen, no. right? Uh, because there not. is some AD. She doesn't some, like the attack uh, speed so much, but the other stuff. And the recent nerf on the passive as well, the auto attacks are not necessarily doing as much damage as they used to with those ratios being uh, kept down just a little bit, might keep her away. Who's going to win plays. the MVP for game number two? I'm not entirely sure. I, I think there's possibly... Well, game two was wrong, but this so game... Game number three, there's yeah. possibly two uh, two options, you know? Roller and roller. Roller and roller. Roller and Cube. I think Cube had, had a good game. He had a chance. He had a good game. He did 30k damage. That's true. Someone doing more damage on Gen G than Ruler is a huge feat, actually. True. This guy did 36%. And we did have a pentakiller win. who didn't win an MVP for dumb one in game number one. That's so. true. Crazy things have happened. That's true. And uh, Ruler only got a quadra kill this game. So, yeah. You, Anyone can do even that. If, even if you get the pentakill, you're not going to get the MVP. No. So, in fact, uh, we just disqualify you. You got, you got <laughs> enough. You got a front page Reddit clip. It's enough. Yeah, What's you're actually never allowed to have uh, an MVP after that point. It sounds like this has been an extended deliberation, so we're only now getting the result. And it, it will is going go to be Ruler. To Ruler. Wow, I didn't even notice he was 7 0 0. Yeah, he was the. Not even legendary. He was the opposite license to kill. Not even legendary. And I like the James Bond reference yeah. there. Wait. So if he. What? He doesn't have a license to kill? Well, as soon as you get 0 0 7. What's the opposite of having a license, license to, to kill? But. Well, I don't know, not having a license to kill, so I guess murder is legal at that point. Or, I guess we're used to that. or he's edgy. He's like, I don't even need the license. <laughs> I'm killing yeah, anyone. Yeah, there he's we just go. a murderer, Atlas. I just know that this is justice. I don't know, he's Batman. <laughs> well, he's Judge Dredd, of course. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah, we got him. Hopefully the old Judge Dredd. Actually, I, I didn't mind the very The old one wasn't so. bad either. Yeah, I know. The old one was great, but the new one actually did not Great didn't is a strong one. Yeah. But uh, Ruler was great. We can definitely say that. Yep. Pull up your ruler. He pulled it off, and Gen G, they're dreaming of, G of greener pastures. And the season's not written against M1 Gaming, but it's already a monkey off their back. So now, short of SKT and Griffin, you kind of look at the other teams and say, "We can do it." It's yeah. Gen G. And uh, Gen G also had this very slow, methodical way of winning the game as well. So they will be another one of these gut check, gut check teams like Hanwha was in our first season as well, which is definitely better than being fodder at the bottom of the you table like they were. you got to be this tall to ride the, uh, the playoffs, and it's yeah. being better than Genji. That's exactly right. But Ruler is standing by for an interview, so let's throw it over to Jisun for some translation. Thank you very much, guys. This is Jisun with Space Interview Translation, and we're going to be hearing from Ruler from Genji picking up two MVPs in a row. Genji has gone through a big change, you know. You guys are back with 10 men roster. All the newcomers, my team, they are all bright. So I think our mood has gotten a little bit more positive, so it's really fun. Is there any hard time in terms of teamwork? Well, for me? I don't have uh, any substitute players, so there's no big problem for me. What about the mid line? Because there are three members in mid. So I guess three of the players have got to be competing a lot, right? I think it's a big encouragement for all the players. I mean, they're getting motivated, and I think they're all three of them will improve. You're speaking like it's none of your business, right? Well, I mean, I'm a bot laner, so there's nothing special for me to tell them, so... I don't know, you know? But anyways, Genji always got ruler in the bot lane, and also... A lot of people are saying that Genji has to change their playstyle, so how did you guys prepare for the summer split? Well, I actually have gone through a big slump during the preparation. So, in terms of the style change, my mindset is that if you just perform really good, it doesn't really matter. Well, just like you mentioned, the Genji is sticking to the uh, bot carry style. So, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it actually depends on the opponent. Well, today we thought that Damon will be playing around the top lane, so we tried to play game around the bot lane on our side. But game one, Damon brought a lot of new champions and some kind of new drafts, so how was game one overall? Well, I was a little bit stressing out. 
well, a lot of flex picks. So we had to think of a lot of possible options, but after going through game one, we were able to bend those champions out, so it was okay. So game two, you guys went with Ezreal Tompkins again. Why was that? Well, we thought that we were good at it, so we went with Ezreal and Brown. I think it was Brown, right? And we are seeing a lot of new champions overall, so what's your favorite one in bot lane? Well, Ezreal? But recently, I am preparing a lot of different champions as well, so maybe I will be able to show up some pocket picks. And Peanut also locked in Skarner, so a lot of people were saying that he resembles Ambition a lot now. Well, he farms really well in the early games and he does really well in the late games, so yeah, I have to agree. Well, Genji showed a very awesome teamwork and great performance today, and your next opponent will be Kingzone, so it's gonna be roller ending versus theft ending. It's all about AD carries, so, and your resolution is going into that match. So theft is definitely one of the best AD carries right now. So if I do well or if I just go smoothly in the laning phase, I think we will be able to win the team fights and smoothly end the game. So this will be the end of the interview with Roller from Genji and I'm gonna pass it back to our casters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jisun. And uh, that is going to be that for day number one, Papa Smithy, to our eye-opening series, for but sure. also series that I feel went exactly right for day one. You know, we had a very KT series and then a very Gen G series. If there's ever a way to ease you back in to the LCK style, that is a great way to do it. And now we have a lot of hype around the Gen G versus Kingzone match they were discussing yeah. because we know what the AD carry situation is, right? If they're set up, one of those guys carry, Deft and Rule or a guard. Oh, yeah. But suddenly the featured matchup to me that we won't see on screens, of course, you just go to the big brands, is Neon versus Kuza. Because suddenly, whichever of those performs better at their role, which should be primary facilitator, yeah. probably actually gets their team the victory. So it's actually a very consequential role, even if neither of them are expected to be primary carries for their team. No, that's a very good point. That is going to be on Saturday, guys. So that's going to be game number two on Saturday. As we have a look at the standings after day one, KT with their 2-0 victory have first place. So KT fans revel in this moment. It's most likely... Uh, may not necessarily be the state of the league in the final days of uh, week one. As uh, tomorrow, we're going to get uh, Sandbox making their debut, followed by Hanwha Life Esports. And then Griffin and Afrika Freaks are going to take to the ring. You and I will be back for those two matches. Both of them have the potential to be competitive, depending on what Griffin's at. Because yeah. obviously, went out with a whimper. Haven't seen them for a long time. Griffin are that high tier team that people are wondering will they just be high tier again or fall away a freaker a team that some people are saying might actually be jumping up the table even though they've made no big change i don't see it just because they never got it together but suddenly kt has some momentum genji has some momentum wouldn't it be a story if those three teams down the bottom who represented Korea at Worlds last year actually all start with victories. Well, could be a potential because Genji and KT have managed to do it in day number one. We'll find out in day number two tomorrow. But for now, that is going to be it for us. Thanks so much, Papa Smithy, for sitting next to me in day number one of summer. We've been looking forward to it for so long. We'll look forward to tomorrow as well. Good night. I'm feeling feather love.